2017. This is a continuation from our broadcast on Tuesday night. This is one of my favorite assignments or groups that we run. We actually run these at our intensives. We run these out in the field. And I think it's one of the greatest illustrations about how we can get stuck in a box with somebody else, how we can see them as the problem, as the identified patient. And this is in the same spirit, if those of you who have either read or seen the, the Broadway musical Wicked, this is to The Wizard of Oz what, um, what Wicked was to The Wizard of Oz. The Letters of Juliet is to the Knight in Rusty Armor what Wicked was to The Wizard of Oz. It's looking at it from a diff different perspective. And, and so to begin, for those of us when we read The Knight in Rusty Armor, if we hear in that story, if what uh, resonates in our mind is that the knight is somebody else in our life, our, our child that we sent away to treatment, for example, the identified patient, if you will, our husband, our wife. If the knight for us represents somebody in our family that we love that's struggling, then this is the book for you. This is a book written by my therapist in the early 1990s, and what she did is she looked at it from the perspective of the wife, at least the wife's story. Um, and, and she talked about it as the idea that the wife who had threatened really, really held a boundary with the knight and said, if you don't get rid of your armor, I'm going to kick you out. I'm going to take Christopher, your son, and, and we're going to leave. Um, th this is what, it, what, what her part of the story, what her part of the dynamic and the dance and the family was. So with that, let's get into it. First of all, Dr. Gill explains the, the metaphor, explains, explains metaphor in general. And she talks about it in terms of the masculine and, and the feminine side, whether it's the knight in the knight in rusty armor or Juliet in the letters of Juliet to the knight in rusty armor. And she talks about the issues, the, the various issues and, and then the symbolism in each. And for the masculine side, the part of the self that they're seeking is towards light, towards enlightenment. And the feminine side is toward life, toward being a part of life. And the quest for the masculine side is outside, it's adventure. And for the feminine side, it's, it's inside. It's looking inside oneself. The armor for the masculine is control with force. And the armor for the feminine is control with anger and withdrawal. The lessons for the masculine are silence, the inner self for the masculine, facing fears. And then, of course, for the feminine are moving beyond conformity, moving beyond fitting in and learning to abandon control or, or will. And so the, the stories that we read, and I, I think where people get mixed up, and I've said this before, I may have said this on the one, the broadcast on Tuesday night, I think where people get confused about Joseph Campbell's model is that the masculine and the feminine don't directly relate or translate into gender, right? There's a masculine and a feminine in all of us. And in Joseph Campbell's idea, gender is just a construct. But the masculine and feminine are parts of the self, parts of the psyche, aspects of the psyche. We talk about in one of my favorite webinars if you, or, or podcasts that you may or may not have read is the identified patient. It's a concept that you learn in graduate school when you're becoming a therapist, when you learn about treating people in programs, specifically around alcohol. It's introduced very well in that field, alcohol and drugs, the identified patient, because they're the symptomatic one sometimes referred to as the lightning rod, the one that kind of catches all the family symptomology and then d displays the symptom of the family. And what we know as therapists is we go in through the door of the identified patient, but really we treat the entire family. If we can think of the individual as just a part of the, the entire animal, which is the family, that that's just where the symptoms are being displayed, but we can look back and from a family systems perspective, we can see the entire system. We can look at that in our culture. I think a lot of times we look at individuals in our cultures who commit heinous crimes famously. And if we take a, a, a big enough step back, we can see how that's indicative of a problem in our culture where somebody's getting lost. I think people are afraid to do that because there's so much energy on accountability there's so much energy on this person has to be culpable and I didn't do it. I, the father, or I, the citizen, I'm not the one who pulled the trigger, drank the drink, whatever it is. But if we have enough ego strength and we, we look at our participation in the entire process, we're much more likely to create 
a healing process for everybody involved. So we, we pay a lot of attention to blame, right? That, that's, that's kind of how we make sense of the world in a lot of ways. We need somebody to bear the brunt of it all. It's important that we learn to cut the link between accountability and mistakes um, and even cause and, and shame. I've talked about this recently. I've, I've spent so much of my career thinking about shame because I've seen it. I was talking to a client today about this, about this idea that you know, most people in self-help and psychology will talk about shame as a sense of I'm bad for who I am and guilt is I'm bad for what I did. And many people, even, even famously Brene Brown in her famous TED Talk, talk about how shame is associated with mental health and addiction issues and guilt is associated with healthy development. In my experience, I don't see that. In my experience, guilt is, is more, more like a, a matter of quantitatively different than shame than qualitatively different. Because most people, when I ask them a question, when they tell me I did the wrong thing, I didn't do the right thing, and I ask them why they didn't, so often the answer is because I felt guilty. What they're telling me is I would have felt guilty if I did the right thing because of how somebody else felt, because I hurt somebody else. If I show up authentically and even compassionately and honestly for myself, I'm going to feel guilty. It's, it's so true. There are some mental health and, 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 and psychologists and, and self-help, like Harriet Lerner, who wrote the book, The Dance of Anger, who understand that that kind of guilt is evidence of a, of a family system, of, of a way of growing up that's part of a big problem. Most people who are on the road to enlightenment, the path of truth, don't grapple with guilt to a great degree. Right? To the extent that they're enlightened, guilt is not a part of it. They don't do things to avoid guilt. They do things uh, as an expression of love and connection. So we make mistakes as parents. We, we do the wrong things as spouses. We do those things. But as we move along this journey, we, we make changes in our life because we desire love, connection, authenticity, kindness. We have empathy for others. We see how other people feel and, and we care for them. Guilt like shame causes us to retreat, causes us to hide, causes us to cover up. So there's so much in our culture, in our families, that connects the, the, the mistakes, the accountability, the, the even cause to a heavy dose of, of shame and even guilt. So we have to cut that, that link. Um, we're, we're worried that if we're fully accountable to somebody else, if we make a mistake, that they're going to hold it over us. It's hard for us as parents. I, one of the assignments I've been talking with families about a lot lately is find one thing to apologize to your child for. Just, just find it. If you need help, I'll help you. Your therapist can help you. Your child's therapist can help you. Find something to genuinely apologize for and stay in that space. That's the greatest way to start to correct the relationship, to open it up, to make it safe. But parents are afraid, right? If I show up and apologize, if I'm vulnerable, they'll use it against me. And what I say and what we're going to learn tonight in this book and this story is it's impossible to hold it against you. Because you're not doing it to get forgiveness. You're not doing it to get something from them. You're doing it as an expression from love. And so whatever they do with that gift it becomes none of your business and none of your concern. You do it for the doing of it. Becoming vulnerable is difficult, right? We, we, so much of what we do that gets us into trouble and hurts others in our life is really out of self-protection. That's why the more that we become enlightened in this process, in the process that we teach at Evoke, the, the less that we, we actually get angry at people because we know that when people show up in, in harmful, hurtful, stupid, ridiculous ways, we just see that they're compromised. And why would we be angry at somebody for being compromised? We're more capable of, because we get this confidence, right? This, this sense of being okay with ourselves that we show up more and more vulnerable. And it's not even, doesn't even feel like a great risk. It's just the way that it is. 
and I feel good about myself, so I'm not really taking a risk. I'm just telling the truth. Becoming a student and growing, allowing old things to die and new things to grow or transform in us. Why I like this story, why we use it in our program, is because I can explain all day the psychological mechanism, the psychology of change. I can outline it. I can explain it. But I like a story. A story evokes an idea and a feeling. We see what it looks like. There's so much that goes on in our society today that people can't see mental health. They don't know what it looks like. What, what happens in our program for the children that we, we, we have in our program, the participants, and their parents, is they start to become aware of what mental health is, what a symptom is. Sometimes we take ourselves too seriously. This goes back to the night in Rusty Arm. I'm going to go through several of the principles, the four chapters of this book, and I'm going to share the principles that I found that jumped out to me. And, and of course, there are a, 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 a host of them that we don't cover tonight. When the knight climbed off his horse um, after he met Merlin, he says, um, I've been looking for you. I've been lost for months. You've been lost all of your life, corrected Merlin. The knight stiffened. I didn't come all this way to be insulted. Perhaps you have always taken the truth to be an insult. We need to learn to look at instruction, correction, coaching, without a sense of being criticized or punished. You know, a lot of times parents get in this, uh, this track of trying to get it right. Right? I don't want to make a mistake. In my way of thinking, the only way you can learn is to just show up, take a risk, make a mistake. And coaching doesn't mean that you're in trouble, or that you're bad. It just means that there's something to learn. And so what I had to learn with my own son in the wilderness is I had to learn to tell the truth and to, to not try to be good. And that gave the therapist, his therapist, an opportunity to coach me and show me what I was missing. It happened this week in a family therapy session of my own, with my own family, where a therapist said something to me and said, can you see, Brad, how that comes across, how that sounds to other people? And I was doing something that I thought came from my heart and was honest. And after a pause, I realized there was something there that I didn't see. So there are four letters written from Juliet, the, the wife of the night. After he left, she was left to herself. I'm going to take you through these four, and they kind of, they kind of illustrate four different stages that she goes through. And I'm going to, I'm going to touch on some of the quotes from it, and kind of teach you what jumps out to me, share with you my thoughts and feelings about this. In letter one, each of the letters starts off with a different way of addressing the night, and ends with a different salutation. So I'll, I'll talk about those. Dear night, excuse me. Uh, the letter number one starts off as dear sir. Ever since you saw fit to leave your son and me so you wouldn't have to take off that ridiculous armor you, you love so much. I've been trying to pick up the pieces of my life, right? So you can feel the anger, right? I sent you away because I'm angry. That ridiculous armor that you love so much, right? Couldn't see the knight was stuck inside of the armor as much as anything. Saw it as something willful. Saw it as something against her. And judgment, of course. My friends from the neighboring castles were quick to agree with me, and you may be sure you'll probably have a tough time of it when or if you return to these parts. So she's sharing the story. She's letting him know that he stands in judgment, that he's the jerk, he's the bad guy. And then further, and expanding on that, she, she uses a technique that they talk about in communication theory called recruiting, right? Everybody thinks about you this way. Everybody says this about you. My mother came to stay, she says, but your son only cried and was very cold to her. I must say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I tried to comfort him, but he would always test the limits and end up hurting everybody's feelings. Perhaps, perhaps it is a male trait, right? There's judgment. Everybody thinks this way. This particular aspect, this is a fascinating one to me because it's, it's, it's fascinating to me that many of us, all of us, I suppose, are, are wounded by our parents to some degree, some more, some less, right? That's just the product of being the child of a human parent. And we end up sacrificing our children for our parents in many ways. In this example, you have a small child whose father has left him, and he doesn't know why. And the two adults that are left in his life, his mother and now his grandmother comes to visit, and he's supposed to take care of them? 
right? His not attending to their needs is his problem. I think this is a fantastic illustration of how absolutely upside down we think about parents and children. It is not a child's job to take care of a parent, but vice versa. But because we, we grew up believing that about ourselves, right? If my parents were upset, I did something wrong. If my parents were disappointed, it was about me. If my parents were proud, it was about me. So it was my responsibility to make them happy and feel good about me and by extension themselves. Further in letter one, blaming the identified pa patient for our reactions. After mother left, Sir Jeffrey, our neighbor, whose wife died in childbirth two years ago, remember, began to pass the evenings with us. I think he was taking with me. And I confess I began to thinking of, think of having an affair with him. He thoughtfully bought me bottles of, and small casts of wine. Once even when he was leaving, he grabbed me and kissed me. I nearly lost my breath. It had been so long since you and I had made love but I was confused and pushed him away. Like the rest of you, he went off that night and hasn't been around since, right? There's not an accountability yet for her. Everything, there's a victimness to her, to her story. Appealing to our culture, to others and what others think and say. I can't decide what to do. My friends tell me to forget you. One of the things I've learned about my journey is that the, the common culture is not a reliable source for wisdom, right? I've seen that in my marriage. I've seen that with the way, raising my children. Is that you? The, the, the truth isn't out there all over the place. It's not on TV. It's uncommon. It's rare. My friends tell me to forget you and get on with my life, but I keep remembering the little things about you. Times we shared when we were happy. When life was full and wonderful. I remember bathing with you in that forest pool, how you held me and how good that I felt. Right? So, so there's a part of us that, that in this story, we felt something and so we question it. Yes, our friends tell, tell me you're just a jerk. Yes, they're telling me I should just leave you. But something in me, something deep inside, I remember what we had once. So I'm willing to question it. And then, of course, there's a, there's a distance in her first letter. I hope you are well and we can work, work this mess out soon, right? I mean, you can feel it dripping in that statement, can't you? You can feel that she's saying, you're still the problem. She uses the word we, but you're still the problem. Letter number two, some time passes. My dearest night, my dear night, she says. It was harder than I imagined being away from Christopher. She went out on her own journey. She went into the woods. She said in, this, in her story that the woods scared her. That she knew that the night always went into it, but for her, it was a frightening place. It terrified her. The woods are the psyche, right? the, the self. The story is about going inside of yourself. That's what the Nine Rest Timer is about. And she realizes she has to do some of that work. So, so the scary place to go for you is an Al-Anon meeting a therapy session, a parent group, a CODA meeting, right? Those are the woods in this story. So she goes into the forest. It was harder than I imagined being away from Christopher. Christopher, many days I thought the longing I had for him would tear me apart and put an end to my crazy journey, for I got lost and crazy indeed in those woods. There's a part in the story where every time she feels that emptiness, that loss, she she longs for Christopher. I think part of that is the symbolism that it's, it's, it's she, he is her comfort. He is the thing that makes her feel, gives her meaning. So she goes back to that. And in this story, this metaphorical story, this, this allegory, she's being asked to look and, and sit with herself and sort it all out. Again, listening to friends. My friends urged me not to go. You remember the feminine story, the feminine challenge, and myths and storytelling is to let go of, of conforming. They don't like you, her friend said. Anyway, they wanted to plan a summer's feast, and I often wish I'd listened to them. My paths were paths of futility. I got lost no matter where I went. The sounds of the woods scared me, and I doubted I would ever survive. I got hungry and sick. Again, going to a place, because 
what happens when we initially have this crisis, and, on, and all of us can kind of relate to it, what happens is that we try what we've already been trying. That's what that means when she said, I got hungry and sick. I, I kept trying to feed myself with the old food, and it wasn't working. She was beginning to experience the, the, the futility of her old way of feeding herself, of her old way of solving the problem. I fell into despair, she goes on to say. I couldn't find my way back or I would have gone immediately. So many people tell me after opening the door that in some ways they wish they could close it again, put the toothpaste back in the tube, so to speak, but you can't. I remember the moment in graduate school when it happened to me, after I read Alice Miller's book, The Drama of the Gifted Child, and I had this moment partway through the book and I thought, oh no, this is going to be a journey. That was almost 30 years ago. I, I, wanted, I couldn't find my way back or I would have gone immediately. I was lost and terrified. I don't know if you have felt this feeling or not, but it was awful. I could not imagine continuing anywhere. My life seemed a long series of failures. A, a parent just told me this, this last weekend. Every impulse I had had been futile. I fell by the side of the mountain meadow where I knew I would die. I sobbed and sobbed for Christopher, for my friends, my mother and father, the Duke and Duchess, and for my older sisters I had not seen in so many years. I even sobbed for you and for the failure our dreams have been. So you feel this despair. This, this, this is the pressure to surrender. This is the, the emotional crisis, the emotional breakdown, when it all becomes too much. And then, of course, like many, many heroes' journeys, that's when the teacher appears. She goes on. I fell by the side of the mountain meadow where I knew I would die. I sobbed and sobbed for Christopher, for my friends and my mother. I even sobbed for the failure our dreams had been. As I was lying there, the strangest thing happened. A woman, I'm still not certain whether she was an apparition, appeared beside me, a strange safe light around her. The light was white and pale blue. Who are you? I asked amazed. I am Marie, she replied. Take a drink from my cup. So somebody comes along who has something else to offer her. I am the woman of the woods, she went on to say, and I've come to you in a form that you can comprehend. When I sat down, Marie poured out a glass of crystal water for me and said, you are well aware of the armor. Are you also aware of your own? I, I think that's the, one of the most profound questions in our lives. You're well aware of your husband's or your wife's armor. You're well aware of your child's armor. Are you aware of your own? And, and like all of us, it is so much easier to see somebody else's armor. Her new encounter was confusing and caused her fear. Whatever it was, it was enchanted. And I feared for my life, she said. A dreath, a dreary death of misery, excuse me, a dreary death of misery is to be preferred, I thought, to the hands of some, uh, some dialogue, to, to the, some dialogue, <laughs> diabolical end at the hands of evil spirit. I decided to run away. Actually, I decided this almost every day I was with Marie. Right? That's the story, isn't it? We want to quit. We want to give up. What they're telling us, this new way of thinking, is insane. It doesn't make any sense. It's contrary to everything I've been taught, everything I believed, the way that I know the world works. So we go into the woods to find the other. That's what compels us. That's what will get you into often an Al-Anon meeting. This is the place where people go to figure out how to fix their alcoholic sons and daughters and spouses. So after much thought, I've decided to try to find you, she concludes. Maybe we can talk. I have to settle this once and for all. I don't know where you are, though I've been told you went back into the woods. I'm terribly afraid of those woods, as you know but I want to find you and see if you are really as impossible and close as I remember, or I did, I just invented. So she's starting to have some doubts. When she was challenged about her armor, when she was asked about her armor, she replied to Marie by saying, I sometimes I wish I had some. She replied, oh, you have some, and it's perhaps greater, but at least more dangerous than the knights. I was a bit insulted by the words, but I decided to listen more. You see the pattern there. Just like the night, when somebody came along and told her the truth, it was insulting to her. 
I don't know what it is. What is it? My worry, she went on to say. Your anger in her is your armor, was her reply. My anger? I was astonished. I don't see myself as angry, I stress. I know, Marie, said Marie. And that is part of the problem. You see everybody's armor but your own. Your anger covers up your fear. Think back, she said, to when you gave your knight your demand. Either you take off that armor or I will take the child and leave, you said. He deserved it. He was ignoring me. I rest my case, said Marie. What if he had said, get rid of your anger or I will take the child and leave? I would have to told him to take a royal hike, I exclaimed. Well, can you hear it, Nat, yet? My patient friend said with an almost eerie grin. I had to admit, the idea began to have some weight with me, though I never considered it before. Somehow she was weaving some magic or something, because ordinarily I would have fought for my own position. Now, strangely, I didn't feel like it. I almost wanted to try something new. I confess I had never thought of myself as being especially angry before. I just thought the world was sadly out of balance, tilting in an unfair way. There's so much profound truth in these passages. She was willing to consider a new idea. Normally, she would have fought for her position, but she was willing to try something new. And she was wondering, is this person weaving some strange magic? But of course, the precursor to this was that she had tried her way to the point that she had almost crumbled and died and starved to death. And then as she began to hear it, she thought to herself, I never thought I was angry. I just thought the world was unfair. I thought things were just happening to me. It's so profound. I can't tell you how many times I've discovered it for myself or I've seen it in others. They don't know that they're angry. They don't know they have an angry problem. See, they think the problem is out there. The problem is with my husband, my wife, my child, my community. I'm not, I'm, they don't even consider that they're angry. They just see it as this kind of justifiable response to this unfair situation. The world is sadly out of balance, tilting in an unfair way. So the first thing is to begin to own your anger and own it as your issue. And that's what Marith is trying to help her see. So how do I let go of it? She asks. The first step is you, to let go of your crusades, your expectations, your endless trying to make your life work to get rid of your fear, your successes in the social club, and simply sit with yourself alone so your true life can find a way to contact you. My true life? The one you discover within you rather than the one you construct outside by your own efforts. Just sit with myself? Just sit here by the stream. How long will this take until the waters are able to give you a true reflection? So this is a metaphor. The, this, the stream is a metaphor for can you find yourself? You came into the woods to look for your, your husband. You came to these webinars, to this, to this program to save your child. But can you find yourself? She talks about how dramatic the transformation was for her. So many people share with me that they, they can't even recognize, in a way, their old self. She talked about her old life closing. I saw it was true. Eyes deep down beneath it all, I feared everything, and my old life closed. And she sat, and she sat. Letter three, she begins, My dearest knight, I'm afraid I lost, I've lost you because I tried to force you to join that club to agree with it. I hope I haven't crippled our son. My tears are endless. There's lots of crying, lots of grieving, lots of letting go. I didn't know anything before. I am writing to you through my tears. I've cried so much, I don't know who I am anymore. One thing is sure, I am not who I thought I was when I tried to live by my own efforts, right? This is that idea of the new self, the death of the old self, the old way of thinking. The thing that many of you, some of you are, are, are alumni to this program, where you can look back and say, I can't remember thinking that way, the way that I thought before. I don't know how to talk to my old friends. I don't know how to sit at a dinner party and have the same discussions that I had. There's this saying in analysis, psychoanalysis, that after you've been in psychoanalysis for seven years, you, it's hard to talk to anybody else who hasn't been in psychoanalysis. That's what this is. It's hard after you've been through this process for weeks and months and maybe even years. It's hard to talk to people who haven't been through it. 
not only because they can't understand you, that's a big part of it, but you don't know how to even relate to, to, to what doesn't matter anymore because old things don't matter anymore. Things have different meaning. I can remember sharing with, with friends at a dinner party at one point about a position that I took on an issue in our family. And, and they, they came at me with kind of the, 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 the culture's way of dealing it, with it. And, and I remember getting upset and my wife saying, you know, you got upset at our friends last night. And I said, I just for once wanted to just explain that I, I don't think that way anymore. Somebody who did me some harm, I forgive him instantly because he was compromised. And all that talk about boundaries and punishing him and injustice didn't matter to me. That wasn't the point anymore. Later in letter, uh, letter number three, to begin to challenge what you've been told, I even began to feel my mother, poor woman, had been my warden. Yes, she kept me from being myself and forced me again and again to fit in. My school friends and the ladies of the castle each agreed. Ours was a difficult lot, they said. Only by sticking together could we find real support in our alien world. I would have done anything, they asked, just to keep from being kicked out of the club. I can see now I should have never listened to them. I joined their club instead of joining life. And, and so we have to break out of the, the, the reality that we know to be true to find the new reality, the new awareness. Suddenly one day I saw my life laid out all about me like the air I was breathing. I realized it was life that mattered, simply life itself. Christopher knew. She has a, an awakening about what really matters. And all that other stuff doesn't matter anymore. Fitting in with the way people think you should live. I always say when I'm talking to people, if somebody tells you they start off a sentence with, here's what you should do, you know that the rest of what they have to say is nonsense. It's irrelevant. Because people that are enlightened don't tell people what they should do. They don't speak and, and tell other people what the truth is. They ask questions. They listen. They understand. They express compassion. They share their own story, their own stuckness, their own foibles. And, and at times they'll share ways in which they found themselves out of it. And they'll always end it with, this is just my story. I don't know if it'll fit for you. This is my favorite line in the book. Something as a therapist, as a father, I try to reiterate to myself to, to speak in my mind over and over again several times a week. She realized nothing needs me to rearrange it, shape it up to my own advantage or triumph over it. This idea, I love what, what Michael Griffin said this weekend when we were co-presenting at, at a parent weekend at a treatment center, he said, the biggest difference between me and God, me and my higher power, God, is that God never thinks that he's me. Right? We have this idea that we should and do know everything and it's our job to fix people instead of figuring out how to support and be there for people and still take care of ourselves and our own boundaries, but expand our capacity to love even more. As she considers her surrender, she asks, was that my great error? Had I been forever lost in trying to arrange my life, my way, to make it turn out the way I wanted so my own dreams would come true? So I had not been, not seen life had more important things to do than pay attention to my dreams? And weren't my dreams my attempt to, to be something or somewhere I was not, rather than accepting what or where I was? Then I realized what uh, what has happened between us? I saw your armor was in the way, but I did not see my expectations were in the way just the same. My anger at you when you wouldn't do what I wanted left you out as surely as your arm left me out. So she's starting to take back in her piece of it, her responsibility in the dynamic. She goes on, that night I had a dream. I was summoned to the great hall of women. There I was laid led before a large group of my women, all of whom began shrieking at me for my betrayal of them. They accused me of abandoning my pledge to keep them first. The unthinkable began to occur to me. I would leave them. I sobbed in an uncontrollable attempt to cleanse my whole life. And again, the, the, the literalness of it is not the point. She was beginning and willing to leave her old ideas behind. The things that had given her comfort before to fit in 
to not stand out, to not be rejected and consider new ideas. It was like when the one woman said to me at, at, a, at a Finding You Intensive last year, she said, when I realized that one of my fundamental assumptions wasn't true for me anymore, I was terrified and realized that all of my assumptions were, were up for granted. Well, excuse me, for, we're up for grabs. And then she goes on to recognize and have empathy for how she'd hurt him. My knight, I have done so poorly with my great love for you. Can you forgive me? I have done poorly with Christopher. At this point, I imagine Marie's voice saying, I had done poorly with me. And like I said, this kind of accountability asks nothing of the other. It needs nothing in return. It abandons the idea that I'm right and you're wrong. I'm more right than you. And it just says, I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm sorry for my part. So find a way to go back to your loved one, the one that, that you've been angry with, and figure out something sincere that you can apologize for. Right? That's the gift. That's the idea. That's what love looks like. As she's getting filled with love, she has more to give. Had I focused so much on outcomes, I'd ignored the land of feelings, which is complete in and of itself. And I think a lot of us parents pay so much attention to outcome that we forget that feelings are just themselves important. Letter number four. She's near, nearing her, her full turnaround. I drifted her with her through houses of dying children of poor people racked with pain. I saw eyes grateful for rags and broken things. I saw them pass each other and touch employed. So she began to feel everything. Her compassion, her empathy increasing. Feeling that I cannot name twisted in my openness. And I realized I must devote my life to save my life. I no longer wanted to succeed or be on top of anything. I did not want applause. She started to recognize her higher purpose and her connection to everybody. And again, there's more grieving. Somehow I can't stop weeping. I am not the wife, the mother, the friend I was before. I have been lifted. I have wept waves of tears for me, for you, for Christopher, and now I am ready to wait for, for what life wants. I saw what it all meant. The answer is not to want or to need anything, since we are life, my dear knight. What do we really want or need? We cannot live because we cannot get beyond our wants and needs. That is what love is trying to teach us. We hear so little. I saw my anger had been in the way of my letting go. It is truly armor, my knight. It kept me too closed in. For the first time in my life, I felt free, and I realized how lucky I was that my dreams had not worked. Let me read that one again. For the first time in my life, I felt free and realized how lucky I was that my dreams had not worked. That's the moment for me as a therapist at Evoke Therapy Programs. That's the moment when I hear a parent say that. I know, I know we're there, and I know they're, they're ready to move on. And they're ready to follow that path and where it takes them. This story that you're in with your child, it is painful. It is scary. It's real. And it also is the key to unlock your awareness and understanding to what white life really is. That's what your children are unconsciously asking for. Something needs to be different. It's not working for me. This story, mom or dad, that you have me in, the story that life has me in, that my culture has me in, I need to get out of it. And I'm going to do it any way I can. She ends with this quote, My night I am quieter. I wish you the trembling of new leaves in summer. I wish you rain. I wish you the laughter of your son. I wish you all my heart, which is my life. Dark blood on the rose, dark tears on the sunrise, dark peace in the stillness, Dark stillness in the sunrise, dark sunrise in the dark time and in the great light. She basically now is embracing everything, not just the good, the positive, the successes, the pain, the joy, the sadness, the hurt, the peace, the serenity, all of it. She's willing to embrace all of it. You know, I, I've just given you some, some glimpses of, of some of the wisdom. I hear clients often quote this book who have never read it. I think there's so much that resonates for so many of us. 
And so I would encourage you to, to read the Nine Rusty Armor, follow up with this, and pause after each. Underline it. When we do it at, at our Finding You intensives, we read it together as a group. And at the end of each chapter, I ask the clients, what did you hear and what did you relate to? And see if you can find yourself in the story. I think it's a wonderful model, idea, about how and what change looks like. It's difficult to describe, like I say. She said, in the time since I met Marith, so much has changed. I scarcely know my name. I can't believe a viewpoint could have changed so much. So my invitation, hopefully this is interesting enough for you to take the time to write it. It's a very, very short read might take you as much as 30 or 40 minutes to read it. If you read it slowly, maybe if you read it slowly and underline it, it might be an hour long. I'm happy to take any questions on the topic before I go on to non-related questions. No questions yet. I'll go to the upcoming announcements and then uh, if there are any questions. We ask all families to go into the forest. And in this version, we ask all families to go to uh, six 12-step programs while their children are with us. Your child doesn't have to have a drug or an alcohol problem. These are these are 12-step programs that help people, that have people in their lives that they love, that are practicing self-sabotaging, self-destructive behaviors. You can replace alcohol or drugs with other things. It's all the same kind of relationship. Al-Anon, CODA, Families Anonymous, Naranon or Alatina are for teenagers. You can also go to NAMI.org to find free resources and classes. classes. Please share in, in, in our podcasts. They are free for anybody. The webinars, of course, are for families and for alumni families. But you can also listen to the podcasts on the go. When you're on the train or out of, out of contact, you download them and you can listen to them while you're offline. If you have an iPhone, go to the podcast app and search Evoke Therapy Programs. If you have an Android device, download the SoundCloud app and search Evoke Therapy Programs. All of our webinars are also podcasts. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Facebook, you can also find us by searching Evoke Therapy Programs. You can also go to the Second Nature Alumni Foundation on Facebook to, to belong or contribute or hear about an organization that helps people that can't afford treatment. Of course, look at our blog. My book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent. Thank you for those of you. A couple of people uh, made uh, comments. I, I welcome on Amazon or Barnes & Noble for that matter. I welcome any honest reviews of the book. Uh, what you like, what you didn't like, helped you. Uh, my book is available on Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. You can also buy uh, an audio version through Audible or a CD purchase on Amazon. Right now, it's temporarily temporarily out of print on Amazon, so you'd have to get the Kindle version um, or go to BarnesandNoble.com. And also, you can find all the books recommended by our therapists by going to the Parent Alumni Foundation on 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 as part of the Amazon Smiles program and you buy the same books that we recommend, and a percentage goes to the charity to help people that can't afford treatment. Upcoming parent support groups, New York, September 13th, Los Angeles, September 24th, um, and uh, the Bay Area, September 25th. It's not listed there. I'll be in Toronto also this year, Nashville, Chicago, and Washington, D.C. The week of the Wilderness Play at the Kennedy Center, we'll have a parent support group that, that week also. If you have more questions or you want to RSVP, please email andrea at therapy.com. We'd like all current families to go to a workshop, if possible. All current families to go to a workshop. There's one this weekend, but I believe that that's closed for now. So the next one is September 23rd and 24th. Um, if you want to do, in fact, our Toronto one is almost, almost full, almost closed. So th there's more people that are interested than there are spaces left. So so act quickly if you're interested. I'll be in Toronto August 22nd through 25th, back in Utah, September 17th to 25th. Those are intensives that I run for deeper work, psychodrama, family and origin work, kind of looking at what's inside of you, having a relationship with yourself. We also have private family intensive or pursuits programs for, for families. If you want to know more about that, go to our website or uh, email intensives at evoketherapy.com. Our pursuits trips, so there's an international trip that's happening already. It's been booked up. It's going to Nepal. So these are trips all around the world and in Utah. Adventure, sober fun, family fun, therapy-like. 
Somebody writes, thank you for covering this topic again. The connections are phenomenal regarding relationships. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. I love this. I love these two books. I, I don't think these webinars can do them justice. You know, there are some webinars where I review a book and I think, you know, it's a good summary of the book, but you, it's like the experience of wellness therapy. You've got to feel it for yourself. So I hope you'll take the time, if you haven't, to buy them and read them. Next comment. Thank you, Brad, for two impeccably timed webinars this week. I reminded how far I've come and how much I'm learning to enjoy and embrace my ongoing journey. I cannot tell you how happy that makes me to hear. That's, that's the joy of this job, is to hear somebody talk about their old life and their new life and recognizing the joy of this new journey, something they never would have planned for, never would have signed up for. They were shoved into it by the, the, the symptoms, the problems with their child, but they found it and it's bringing them joy. When you said your son or daughter is telling you they didn't, let me read this. When you said your son or daughter is telling you that they don't fit in the story we have for them, it resonated with me. She is so brave in saying just that. I continue to work through truly listening while working hard to hold uh, compromised people, including me, gently. My daughter is so brave and evoked helped her find her part again. I'm so thankful that we are on this journey. Again, I'm so thankful. Another parent says, I feel the same. Uh, the Gifted Child Book confused me. Could you cover this again? Thank you. We do have a webinar and a podcast on the drama of the Gifted Child. I will cover it eventually again. I covered it not so long ago, so I encourage you to look at what's already there, and, and I will for sure cover it again. It's my favorite book. I'll cover it once a year. Any other questions or comments, Andrew, before we close tonight? All right. Thanks for joining us, folks. Thanks for sharing this journey with me and allowing me to share my experiences with you. It is a, an absolute joy to do it. The next webinar, I haven't decided on the topic yet. It'll be Tuesday evening, the 31st, at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Have a great weekend, safe weekend. Take care, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.